Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining the Rotating Machine section webinar. Today's discussion will be on medium voltage submersible mine shaft drainage pump motors, rewind and repairs considerations. Before we start the webinar, there's a, there's a few webinar considerations. Attendees are reminded to ensure the volume is turned up on their devices. Ensure you have a stable internet connection. This will ensure that the streaming and audio will run smoothly. Attendees can ask questions via the question panel located within the GoToWebinar control panel by default. The control panel is located on the right-hand side of your screen. The chat function is reserved for webinar organizers and panelists to communicate with attendees. Attendees will not be able to chat with each other, however, are encouraged to ask questions. A recording of the presentation will be made available on the SAIEE YouTube channel and SITV. The recording will also be made available on the SA website under events drop down menu in this section. Past events and webinars. This page is updated regularly to ensure your you check back as often as possible for new uploads and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more uploads. A certificate of attendance will be issued a few days after this webinar. The facilitator for today is Job Obeme, the uh, chairman of the rotating machine section. Job Obeme uh, completed his BEng and MEng in uh, electrical engineering from the University of Johannesburg. He also completed his BTEC degree from Vault Triangle Technicon. He holds the government certificate of competency in electrical and mechanical engineering. He has more than 20 years experience working in the electrical machinery repair research industry. He currently works for the South African Power Utility ESCOM as a researcher specialist in assets condition monitoring. He is a member of the Institute of Engineering Council of, uh, of uh, South Africa and the South Africa Institute of Electrical Engineers. Um, for Mechanical and Electrical Engineering Council of uh, South Africa as well. Thank you, Jabu, over to you. Thank you very much, Joen. Just wanna greet everybody. Before we, we start our, our uh, webinar, I would like to introduce Richard Patin. Richard has, a, 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 has begun his career as a man, uh, at, man, at maintenance and court in South Africa as a trainee technician manager from 1982 until 1993. He then relocated to Zimbabwe from 1993 until 2002 and continued his career as the country service manager for ABB. From 2002 until 2006, Richard relocated to, to the USA at the steel handle as the production manager. From 2006 until the present, Richard now fills the role of the divisional COO of Ed Martinez and Goods South Africa, Cleveland, a division of the Actom PTY Limited Group. Let's get Rob. Uh, okay, so Rob is not, is no stranger to, to us. And Rob, uh, uh, Robert, uh, Rob graduated in electrical engineering from the University of the Red Run in 1993, where he developed a passion for electrical machines that remains with, with, with him until today. Rob has presented courses and authored uh, and co-authored papers and articles both nationally and internationally. He's a member of the SIEE, South African Institute of Electrical Engineers, as, as a as past chairperson of its rotating machines section and the current chair of SABS Rotating Machines Technical Liaison Committee, the, the, the IEC is known. Robert has also chaired the Electrical and Allied Industries Association, a South African S SEIF IFSA employee organization. He is a member of Wales University's and Northwest University's Industrial Advisory Board. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Richard. It's up to you, Richard. Are you starting? Over to you. Yeah, I mean, we're going to start now.
Sorry, it's quite a big presentation, so it takes a few seconds to load. Um, can you see it, or must we? I think we've got a, a swap screens here. Well, I can see it from my side there, Rob. Can you see a presenter, presenter view or a or a slideshow view? I see a slideshow view. Okay, so you can see just the whole slide. You don't see a, 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 a presenter view on the side. Uh, uh, Rob, if you can just swap your screens, please. Okay, done. How's that? That's better. Okay, okay, Jane. Okay. That's okay, yes. Okay, sorry about that. We had the same problem during the dry run. These things happen. We, we're using two screens here, and if we want to see the main uh, presentation screen on the big screen, we, we, uh, it, it, swap, it interacts with yours. Um, I'm just here to introduce the, the presentation and the first few slides. Um, the, the presenter is my boss, um, Richard Button. Um, he's, the, as Jabba mentioned, the CEO of Martinez & Coots, divisional CEO. Um, so he, I did very little of this work. I was probably involved in a bit of technical advice and some uh, root cause failure analysis, which was still fun in itself and testing and things. But um, generally, I sort of prepared the presentation with material given to me from the MNC team and Richard. Um, so basically, this is about some work that we did on very large submersible pump motors. Um, and... Uh, and specifically, the, the challenges to, to rewind them. Um, okay, the, the, this is what the presentation will be about, just some background information. Um, the pump designs themselves, okay, they they uh, roughly 2.4 megawatt um, four pole pumps, uh, about 20 meters long. Um, and as Richard pointed out, or will point out, they weigh about 50 tons complete. Um, the, and then how that leads into the pump motor designs, what's special about them and why. Um, and then this, how the specialities influence the challenges of rewinding these machines, apart from the mechanical aspects of, of repair and refurbishment. Some interesting technical facts, those occur throughout the presentation. What work was done, what challenges were encountered, why the pumps are so important, and then the usual acknowledgements and questions or discussion. Okay. Um, the application of the, of the pumps, it's basically submersible um, uh, acid mine drainage water uh, um, pumping. It doesn't have to be acid mine water, it can be just normal mine water, in fact any water for that matter. Um, obviously the cleaner the water is the better and Richard will discuss some of those issues. Why are they medium voltage? They're 6.6 .6 kV, simply because they, they go down to a depth of about, of about 370 meters and, and low voltage cable to handle that, uh, the, the current involved for 2.4 megawatts would just be a, a, a way, way, way too um, heavy. Um, the players are a mining company in Zambia. Um, acid drainage customers in, in South Africa, I'll mention those just now. It's mainly TCTA, the Trans Caledon um, Tunnel Authority which I never heard of before this, but I'll explain what they are. Um, and then, um, the, the, um, and then the, the pump OEM hundreds um, from Europe. Um, you'll see that the, we discuss failure mechanisms. The, the electrical failure me mechanisms are very simple. They just fail state of winding or healthy state of winding. And then the mechanical uh, um, issues are, are quite complex, common, and also quite difficult to address, especially if you, it's difficult to access spare parts. And then Richard also mentioned why they're two slightly different um, mechanical designs. Okay, very quickly, acid mine drainage. TCTA, the, the, the trans caledon Tunnel Authority, is the um, entity, well, let's go back a step. Um, with the mines in, on, to, specifically here in uh, Bukwatisrund, or Gauteng, um, have filled up with water over the years. And, um, Nobody has taken responsibility for draining the water. And by the time it, it was recognized as a serious problem, the, the, the mines had already dissolved, long since dissolved. So it was left up to the government. And the, so they assigned the Trans-Caledon Tunnel Authority, who are 
responsible for water transfer between Lesotho and Gauteng and that sort of thing. Um, they assigned them with the, the acid mine drainage project. And there's three basins, Western Basin, Central Basin, and Eastern Basin. And where we worked specifically is Eastern Basin, which extends from roughly where we are here to Springs. Um, and I'll show you a little bit of information about that. The, the, on Eastern Basin, there's one of the pumps. Um, it's, it, there are three of them, um, and they're at a depth of, of 270 meters. That's, this is a, a rough thing. These, this is the piping. This is where the, the, the middle picture is where the, um, the pipe that the, the pump goes down. Um, and then the right is the, is the fully assembled pump. And that's the part that um, Richard says weighs 50 tons, points up, weighs 50 tons. The very roughly, the rated power is 2.4 megawatts, rated voltage 6.6 .6 kV, and rated current 259 amps. And here is a schematic model of Eastern Basin, and you can see that Davyton on the left here, and down to sort of mid Eastern Johannesburg on the on the right here. There's Jeppy Town, and this is the, the pumping arrangement. So there's there's lots more lots more information about this. Um, acid uh, mine drainage can be there's a lot of mine drainage that occurs in the Bartabar, and the problem there is not acid water but salt. The water has got a lot of salts in, so that's a, a background about acid mine drainage. And I'm going to hand over to Richard. I'll make a, a odd comment um, because, but this is all he knows much more about this than I did. He handled the project and ran the team. Obviously, managed them completely. Um, thanks very much, Richard. Well, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> when it comes to the to the pumps, these are well, the pump motors. They are incredibly unusual, and certainly certainly very unusual to our normal day, our day to day, um, you know, existence when it comes to just normal plant motors and foot mounted machines. These, these, these pump motors are in excess of about three and a half meters long. And, uh, and, in, and in some instances, certainly up in the, on the copper belt up in Zambia, there's a, there's a massive cooling, um, <clears throat> a cooler that's, that, that fits onto the other end of these, of these machines, which takes advantage of the, of the ambient water within the borehole to actually cool the cool the machine down. Um, the the machines primarily run shaft up, so so you've got a so you've got a, an, an enormous power cable that uh, that's an integral part of the of the of the the upper assembly of the machine, and um, and that that obviously the cable <clears throat> runs up with the shaft up with a with a with a quite a quite a quite a big pump that that fits onto the to the other end of it, which is probably can run in excess of 12, 12 different multi stages that, that run on that on top of it. With the with the pipes and everything like that, like Rob mentioned earlier on, you know the, the whole pump assembly, we we could be looking at probably in excess of 50 tons, and um, it's quite a quite an quite a unusual type of uh, thing there. They do pump fresh water, but uh, but you know in many instances they are pumping. Um, you know, bad water. You know, in Zambia, I mean, the, the the corrosion levels on some of the 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 acidity levels of some of the water that they pump in there is quite uh, is quite horrific. And then, uh, and you can see that by some of the damage of the pumps that have actually that have been living under the under these conditions for many many years. And um, so yeah, so um, mechanically, these these machines are incredibly complex complex. Um, they like I said earlier on, they run with a shaft up, so you've got quite a you've got quite a an, an integral, a, a delicate um, thrusting assembly that fits on the on the non-driving side of this thing, and then um, the shaft is suspended in the vertical position, um, as with a, a combination of, uh, of of guide side supports that are that are, are made out of a, a a very special carbon composite and uh, some very um, well polished, um, you know, sleeves that actually fit, you know, around the machine that actually ensure that she that she's that she's running in center and 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 within uh, within the the dimensions of all the mechanical needs and uh, and specifications. But uh, the, one of the most important, one of the most unusual thing about these motors is that they actually run um, completely underwater. So they have a 
a self-contained water system within themselves. So the pumps actually um, they, they 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 are pressurized and they 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 basically keep the bad water out and uh, the whole cooling mechanism within the pump is a is a closed circuit water system that uh, that um, that doesn't allow the the surrounding water in. So by doing with you know with with by taking that into account, I mean uh, you've got a on the on the drive in side you've got a, a pretty sophisticated uh, mechanical sealing arrangement that keeps all the water out, and then you've also got the some 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 a whole range of of various seals and and O rings that uh, that prevent the the water coming in. Um, the machines, uh, certainly some of the machines, the machines that we've repaired up in Zambia, they are um, filled with uh, a water glycerin type mixture. So the, the, the and it's distilled water. So we try and keep all the all the nasties out to to prevent rust and everything like that. And then obviously the glycerin acts as some sort of a an anti-rust and a and some sort of a um, a protection, you know, on the on the core and and windings. Um, Lubricant for the bearings. And the, and the lubricant for the bearings, yeah. So, and then the, the one of the most special parts of this winding is uh, that it's a it's a it's a it's a single winding with with a continuous strand of wire. Um, so what we've done is that we wind the machine with six half half phases, um, and each each phase is probably about 150 meters of uh, of conductor. Now the conductor is of um, of uh, it's a it's a very specialized product that only probably one or two OEMs in the world actually manufacture, and uh, we 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 choose <clears throat> we we procure the the winding kit through a through a German OEM, and um, and that's who we get to 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 that's who we have the most confidence with, and they have, are the <clears throat> are the approved um, supplier by. By the actual, by the motor, you know, by the OEM themselves. Um, it's not, uh, it's not an off-the-shelf um, product. These, 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 um, these winding kits are, are, are specially customized to suit uh, customer requirement. Um, and um, and in doing so, you know, you have to, you have to. There's a, it's quite a long lead time, probably between between three and four months to to actually get the kit out of here. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's incredibly heavy. Uh, so you know, and to try and shorten you know lead times up in critical parts, we we typically air freight the kit out, and uh, at, at huge expense. Um, but you know, like a, it's uh, it's it, it's quite a complicated affair because uh, <clears throat> you 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 dare not um, because of the expense of the of the kit and and stuff like that. You dare not you can't go and over compromise and allow for any. Any overruns on material or stuff like that. So, so your whole winding procedure and winding process is is uh, is super refined, and uh, and it has to be very carefully thought out, and um, you know, and uh, quite a lot of thought goes into the whole thing. At the, you know, the, we cut our teeth on one of these machines in uh, in October 2018, I think, or 19, and uh, and we had re really good intentions of. Uh, Getting uh, um, some European expertise out here to come and help us and and show us the way forward and you know educate us on how we what tools and um, and equipment were necessary. Um, you know I went overseas for a quick visit to 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 try and put things together there and have a look and see and uh, everything everything was going ahead according to plan and then obviously uh, unbeknown to all of us the the pandemic hit and. Um, uh, you know, price um, or travel travel bans were imposed on all of us. So end result was is that we had a we had a, a very productive uh, mine sitting in Zambia with uh, with no spare pump. And uh, these pumps are are very are responsible for dewatering some of the the open pits up there. So you know we were under big pressure to perform, and um, and we we eventually. We, we did whatever we could to try and uh, and get the Germans to to travel out here and help us, but unfortunately, you know, the lockdowns and all the procedures that were put in place, we were basically forced to to go alone. You know, it's, and I suppose that that's in a way that's you know one of the one of the one of the good things that COVID has 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 brought upon us is that we've had to 
we've had to go it alone in some very difficult times and we've learned and we've got some some really good success stories so so you are together with our our german friends in market we had lots of zoom calls and uh, and lots of um high power discussions is exactly how we're going to do this thing obviously things got lost in translation and you know you know it became quite a became quite a difficult challenge but we we we, we put our minds together and we kept a level head and we have, have uh, we've uh, we put it together and i think that I'll, I'll show you how we how we basically went ahead and did the whole thing so 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 one thing for for certain is that you you've got to try and eliminate as many joints as you can because because the machines are running underwater and um the the situation is not normal is that we need to you need to keep away from as, from as many joints as you possibly can so <clears throat> So we decided to to wind it with six half joints. So you had three cross connections, and then uh, then you've obviously got a star point, and then the main leads that that fit onto the main power cable. So we 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 came up with a plan where we we developed these um, these like bullet type copper ferrules, where we uh, we 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 thought that you know tapered on both ends, and and we had to try and and um, you know, polish these joints and make them as, as slick as we possibly could because of the, the vulcanizing tapes that we that we had to use and to ensure basically, you know, a, a, a super seal to 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 stop these to stop uh, water ingress. And I'm and I'm sure you could appreciate it. You know, just the you know, <clears throat> if we did if we did have a water leak and stuff like that in a, on a joint, I mean, the disruption to an end user of one of these pumps is absolutely catastrophic. I mean the the, the headache and pulling these things out, the headache and cost and actually removing one of these pumps, taking the whole thing to pieces, only to find that you've got a a, a substandard joint would be it would be a very hard pull to swallow. So a lot of um, a lot of time and effort went into actually masterminding basically the perfect joint where where we have to where we had to ensure that a a, a, a totally and and and, and, water, and waterproof joint. That was all fair and well on uh, on just uh, you know basic um, series connections or cross connections like we have on the top right. But when it comes to the cross the, to the the star point, that became an interesting challenge because we've obviously got a, a crutch there that needs to that needs to be taken into account. And uh, and yeah, so the other thing about it also being a 6.6 .6 kV machine is that. Uh, We've got uh, you know various forms of stress grading that needs to be respected, and we needed to to, to to fully understand exactly how the joint was going to be executed and what what tapes and how we were going to do it. So yeah, so the the joints took us a long time, but we we got to take it to the absolute total extreme to make sure that they are, are super smooth and slick, and then you then we went ahead and, and vulcanized the joints. So. That's that, that's that's those are the joints up at the top there, and there's a star point on the on the bottom left. We've subsequently changed the design on that on that star point where we've uh, instead of binding it with little pieces of binding wire like that, um, we've gone ahead and actually made a ferrule, a, a, a two to one ferrule, so you can get a, a better joint. You'll see that the the, the joints are not silver soldered with uh, with with uh, with high temperature um, padding. We uh, we use a, a pure tin solder, and the reason why we do that is not to put as not to, to try and get as less as little heat as we can into the into the the, the protective coating of the wire, and uh, and and that uh, that goes a long way. So some special um, you know soldering irons and all bits and pieces that go with it. Some real heavy duty stuff because the last thing you want is a cold joint when you when you when you're joining. So it all worked out, and everything seemed seemed fine. Um, very special tapes. They all um, all imported from Europe, and there's a, a very special procedure on how to to go ahead and, and apply the tapes and all the and the and the stress grading. If I can just comment there. That's that's the OEM connection, and, and that's the uh, um, modified or uh, thing. So it's actually quite sort of just a plug for MNC there. Yeah, if, if that's allowed. So that'll be, what you what you see here is uh, is the winding that is basically finished. These are the the plain ends of the winding. So um, you'll see that the 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 core is basically a tube to try and uh, 
try and reduce as many losses as possible. This is all this is all fair and well, but what you basically got now is that you've got a closed slot. So by having a closed slot, what's happening now is that you've got uh, you've got you need one one um, one length of conductor, um, so to to wind the half slot. So we have to go in now and then uh, despool probably between 150 and 200 meters of of conductor, and um, and then you've got to then you've got to look after that conductor, and then you've got to start winding it up. We'll get into it later on, but uh, but that's exactly where the challenge comes in: is is trying to trying to wind a, a two and a half thousand kilowatt machine with a, with a single strand of conductor. Um, in in theory, it all sounds very it sounds easy, but uh, practically, when you you need a, a lot of space and you need to take uh, extreme caution when uh, when handling that that conductor, it's uh, it's pretty delicate and uh, it can't take too many bumps and knocks. So, you know, you know the, the, what I was talking about earlier on, you know, taking it to the extreme on the joint is one thing, but, but protecting the, the outer sheath in general is, uh, is, uh, is uh, you know, is, is, uh, is of huge importance because the last thing you want to do is start doing your tests and finding that you, you've got a nick or a burr halfway through your winding and then, uh, that means you've got to take it out, you've got to cut it out, you've got to, you're adding another joint, and then nine times out of ten, you don't, you, you're going to run out of conductor because you don't have enough conductor to to allow for all the for all the these redundant um, mistakes that could happen. So you've got to take it take it very really carefully. Stripping the machine, this is the this is the you know you know mechanically it's uh, it's complicated, and uh, typically when they are living when these machines are living in uh, in harsh conditions and in acid environments, uh, although these machines are all made of an incredibly sophisticated stainless steel, you know corrosion does creep in, and uh, and and all sorts of bits and pieces, you know, corrode and wear and and everything like that. So, you know, taking the machines to pieces is not a is not a is not an easy job, and you've got to make sure that you've got all the right tools and equipment to to deal with these these big heavy um, uh, end shields and sleeves. Um, this is this is a typical example of us taking one of the one of the pumps to pieces, um, and you'll see that it's all made up of sleeves and and real heavy end shields and so forth. Like but we'll get into the, the mechanics on the next slide, I think. So yeah, so on the on the on the left hand side, you'll see that uh, that's tip that's a typical rotor where. Where you basically got to um, it, to try and deal with um, with turbulence within the within the within the rotor, you've got to you've got to and you can't add weight onto these machines, so you've got to you've got to take weight off on the on the balance rings, and um, and but obviously you've got to try and you know the the holes have to be as precision as you possibly can, and uh, you'll see on this particular rotor it looks like there's been a a complete overkill of weight on this on this particular rotor, but this was uh, there's a reason for that, and I'll explain that to you later. Because you know what was happening is that uh, the mechanical seal uh, burst on this thing, and you know you know acid water crept into this thing and basically eroded the core. So we had to make a correction because um, the delivery of a new rotor was just going to take too long. So so there it is. There, I mean. Uh, there's a typical case of what, what some of this acid water did. You know, through it, it penetrated the machine through through a faulty mechanical seal and uh, and contaminated the water within the within the closed circuit. And uh, you, and it's quite weird to see that um, that the that the that the bad water didn't have much didn't have any much influence on the copper bars or the short circuit rings, but it certainly had an effect on the on the on the adjacent steelwork. Um, this was quite an interesting concept that took us uh, a bit of time to 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 try and try and understand it. But yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a typical example of uh, electrogalvanic um, wearing or um, corrosion as opposed to to friction. You know, typically see things like it in in, in dusty environments and stuff like that. But this is underwater in a, in a mine shaft. The, the the rotors look like little torpedoes where they They've got a, a very, very low center of gravity, uh, quite difficult to balance. Um, 
you know, they, everything's all sick, you know, everything's all smooth and torpedo-like because uh, because of the, 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 the obviously you want to try and reduce as much friction as you possibly can with the machine running in, in underwater. So, so yeah, so it's a it's a very it's a very slick little little machine that uh, that we look at. That's, that's obviously got to be as streamlined as possible. You'll see there on the on the on the, the right hand slide is that um, the, the the stainless steel sleeve that actually um, that acts as the guide in the big carbon in the big carbon sleeves that actually hold the hold the, the machine upright in, in the vertical position. It's quite interesting on the on on the on the on the Zambian machines is that there's a it's it's mixed with uh, with glycerine and water like I mentioned earlier on and that's uh, it's uh, it's quite a unique um, combination that the machines are actually stored like that so it's, it's actually acts as like a lubricant and and you know prevents all unnecessary um, corrosion. So yeah, so some of the winding challenges is that, like I said earlier on, is that you've got a, you've got these 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 cable lengths of between 150 and 200 meters long. Um, um, you, so you need you need a lot of space. So so you 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 wind so you've got winders at both ends of the machine, and then you've got a, a take up on the one side, and then to try to try and pull 150 meters of wire that's in excess of like 10 millimeters in diameter. Um, you, you're looking at, uh, at, ex at some, some, you know, a lot of force and a lot of energy to pull that through. So what we decided to do was to to make some sort of a, a donkey arrangement on the other end using a capstan type wheel and friction to try and pull the pull the conductor through. And on the other end, we had um, a takeoff pivot to that we that we used to 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 loop the loop the wire around because, like I said, it's it's one continuous strand and um, so this this the, the, this picture here on the on the right on the left hand side is a, is a typical example of the of the non connection end um, where the the, the, the the capstan or something like that sitting on the other side and and using and using the the pulling effect to pull the wire through um, and in doing so you know at the end of every turn you've got to turn the, you've got to turn the whole batch upside down because the last thing you want to do is get that kinked hose pipe effect and uh, and because that will That'll just uh, damage the conductor, and you've got to live with that. You're going to have to live with that kink in the in the, in the thing, in the in the job, and um, you'd never be able to get the kink through through the through the closed slot. So, you know, extreme caution has to has to happen here. Okay, so now what we do now is to to to, to try and uh, to try and um, Simulate the, the 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 layering effect in the in the core is that you we use a, a whole combination of um, of uh, steel pins. Now each pin is uh, the identical diameter of the wire, and uh, and that and that. So what happens now is that you before you start winding and stuff like that, you predetermine your lay and understand exactly how you how you're going to lay your your conductor, and obviously you'll start from the bottom working your way up. So the, the 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 pins are of uh, those are those are your best friends because they they're the ones that uh, ensure that there's no kinks or crossovers in the slot and then that, that you don't have to go back and and perform any rework so without the pins you you know the, you're wasting your time but um, so yeah so you say so, say so at the each of every turn on this particular unit the I think we had odd turns I think there were eight. 898 or 989 or whatever it was but um, and you then you just uh, you predetermine your your lay with the number of pins that you're going to use and then each conductor you, you, you just replace one pin with with, uh, with 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 one end of the conductor and uh, that's basically how you how you get the lay but uh, the length of the pins and and how you how you predetermine the the shape and uh, and shape of your of your end windings is also of, of, of huge importance we use special jigs and uh, and and brackets that we wind under the jigs just so that we can get uh, a, a very sensible lay so <clears throat> in this particular instance here on the left hand side you'll see that's the other end of the machine where the, the, the machine in front of you is the 
is the friction wheel, is the capstan, and um, you that, and that's what's that's what's pulling the conductor through. Um, you'll see the the, the 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 spool of conductor that we use is that we we never ever cut it until until it's right at the end. So you have to you have to predetermine your your conductor length. So we make dummy coils and predetermine the conductor length, and then you've got a a, a very high precision um, length counter that, uh, that 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 predetermines your your offtake. So so that that predetermines your your, your the, the length of the conductor, and then that stays basically. Well, I mean, it's it, it stays the, the 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 drum stays charged until until the end of the wind, and then only then once we have have fitted the whole winding, and we're confident that that everything's okay, then we'll go ahead and and cut the cut the conductor because the last thing you want to do is just go ahead and guess a length and then have a whole lot of waste at the end of this thing and. Uh, because um, you cannot, you it's it's almost impossible to to make the joints, and if you get a joint halfway, uh, you certainly will never be able to join a conductor in the slot. So you want to try and make it, you want to wind the phases as full as you can in in one in one length. But at, at the same time, you cannot waste any any conductor, otherwise that becomes a, a that will become detrimental. And trying to Organize new conductor and stuff like that halfway through a wind was just going to really upset a lot of people and be extremely costly. Yeah. So this is this is basically this is the the, the basic layout. This is where we were we were predetermining the um, the trial. We 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 used a whole lot of uh, other wire and we just predetermining the how the how the machines were going to work and everything like that because you'll see in the in the, in the right-hand photographs is that we we chose to wind this thing in a in a controlled environment with uh, with um, you know with vulcanized floors and everything like that to try and and, and keep the, the 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 process as protected as we possibly could. So there you'll see that uh, in 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 general the, the the whole winding and how much area you need you're probably looking at probably between 50 and 70 meters long. And and um, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a good few hands to try and deal with the with the wire. <laughs> You'll see that um, that the, on either end of the of the of the stator, you've got uh, you've got a you've got foot controls onto the capstan at the back there to 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 to, to slow things down and um, just to to ensure that you don't get any overruns or you you don't start. You know, you've got you want full control at any one time because uh, if anything gets jammed or something like that, you can't have that uh, that part of the procedure being someone else's responsibility. So it, a lot of a lot of caution goes into this whole thing and uh, and a lot of training. Yeah. That's it. You know, it's uh, at the at the other end. You know, you're dealing with 150 meters of wire of cable, so you've got. Um, so you, you, you've got at the beginning and the end. So you you've got to be incredibly disciplined in how you how you stack the and how you lay the cables on uh, on the on the ground. You, we thought about having um, take up take up spools going in either direction, but that that was just going to add a, a memory into the conductor, which was going to be hard for the winders to to deal with. So we decided the just big loops on the ground. Um, you know. Obviously, you know, on canvases to try and protect it all, and uh, taking it from there. But like I said, the, 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 the most important thing is to is to stop getting that uh, that kink, the kink, a kink conductor, and um, and, and you, you know, just trying to trying to deal with that would be a complete nightmare. So yeah, here's 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 a, here's a good slide that that'll shows you from from beginning to to end. So you'll see that the on the, on the left side, that's uh, that's the first coil. That's uh, that's one third of one phase. So, and then uh, then you'll see that as as time progressed, I mean, and the, the wires got shorter. You know, it, uh, we, we 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 put the, the the full winding in, and then uh, the the far left, or the the, the left hand thing there is um, that's the complete winding that with uh, with the the big. Um, um, Big composite uh, diffusers inside there to to try and help you 
we, that, that helps protect the winding against when you're putting the rotor inside. And, um, and you also have a look inside there, in the, in the inside there, there's a stainless steel ring that actually forms part and parcel that, that closes off the slot so we don't get any, any migration of the wires actually wanting to pull through the slots. Um, and quite interesting enough is that the wedging material that we use on those slots was just straightforward pine. I was a little bit confused about that in the beginning, but, uh, but you know what happens is that pine actually absorbs water and, uh, and, and, and you know, it basically, it, it's, it, self, uh, it self swells. So you don't have to put to try and, and put a nice tight wedge in, uh, a, a single wedge in a distance of like three meters becomes almost impossible. But the, the pine becomes your friend and, uh, and, yeah, and swells in the water and, and that becomes, a, you know, it, it's, it's a good wedging media. It's 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 quite it's it's a little bit too effective because trying to get it out, you know, after many years of service becomes a, a challenge. And the only way you can remove those windings is to is to actually cut them out. There's no there's no ways that you can ever that there's a simple way of removing those wires and and attempting some sort of a patch repair or anything. Testing of the of the unit is uh, is seriously unusual and uh, com and defies all all you know much winding practice um, so what we're doing with this thing because it runs underwater and we're using special conductor is that all the tests are conducted underwater so so we we've got these big um, these big baths where we we take the stator and we we, we test it at, 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 at the end of each half phase we, we we test to just make sure that we that we that we're good <clears throat> so just a normal some routine tests of just you know, mega tests at 5 kV and then just some resistance checks because we need to, we need to, you know, understand that our, our resistances are all balanced on each phase because we, you know, we just got to double check our, our, our measurement. And then the, the high voltage tests are, are quite unusual. So, we, so we're testing to a full IEC uh, spec, 6.6 um, .6 kV machine uh, at 14.2 kV to ground underwater. So, you know, so so the tests are, are quite hectic and are, are quite unusual. This is a machine here where we got the the, the, the entire stator completely submerged underwater, and we we leave it there for 10 minutes just to just to get it soaked and everything like that to also um, give it. If there is an if there is an, a, a, a damaged or a nick conductor, is that it gives it time for the, the water to seep in and uh, and and then, and then we will do our tests, and uh, that's it. So after every half phase, we we repeat the tests, and you can see here that um, you know the I think that these these last these certainly the <clears throat> these two tests that we're talking about here are the completed winding, and um, so you'll see that we we submerge them, and then when they when they finish testing and everything's okay, that uh, we drain it out. But you know it's the, the the marking of the connection is of top importance because you know you still got to do your, your crossover connections with with very long leads so um, you just got to make sure that your that your identif your identification and, and marking of the leads is uh, is is good there's the winding there completely finished um, on the on the on the plane side like we say we just still got a, a few bits and pieces to carry on there we've got a we got to put the <clears throat> that ring in there and then in the stainless steel support, but basically that's a that's a complete uh, rewind that was uh, that was done in our shop here in Johannesburg. That's it there. That's uh, the last phase coil going in there. Well, the the second last phase coil going in. So you'll you can see there where the where the pins actually. Um, you know they, they they play a very very important role in your life and and you can see that it's it's a it's a nice neat winding with no crossovers or or, or bad connections and um, it, it it's yeah it winds well so this is us doing the connection end so the connection end is never that's the that is probably the most challenging part of the, of this job is doing the connections so. You don't you don't have much room you don't have much room to work with when doing the connections um, and I'm sure you can appreciate the 
the power the power cables that um, that that join up onto these machines are are in excess of between 250 and 300 meters long, and uh, they they it's 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 not advisable to to put a joint in those things. So um, in some instances, people do join them, but uh, certainly our, 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 our customers up in Zambia they load the the idea of uh, of a joint in their main power cable. So <clears throat> so. So we have to make a we have to make a join and, and join the, the cable. So on a typical connection like this, we've got three cross connections, and then you've got um, then you've got a start point. So, <clears throat> but because the, the the power cable is an integral part of the of the of the end shield, and you and you can see that on this slide here is that the cable comes through the end shield and then goes onto the onto the winding. Is that um, you've got to have space and you've got to and you've got to allow yourself room to actually tuck those those connections in behind the the winding in the cavity that you've created so if you fill that if you fill that entire cavity up with with windings and what your size is wrong you'd never ever be able to fit the power cable in and um and that becomes that that is of of absolute huge importance because you've got to you've got to be able to accommodate that uh, that cable now the cable is what they call a chicken foot connection, where it's a it's a it's a it's a, pre it's a precision vulcanized joint, where you we actually where you actually joining the main power cable onto the windings themselves, and that can be that is quite a that can be quite an involved process, that um, that, uh, that that needs a, 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 a tremendous amount of expertise. Um, the, the, the chicken foot, what we call a chicken foot, that that, that vulcanizing, uh, the vulcanizing portion of the main power cable, that, that's a precision foot that actually fits into into a uh, a cavity within the end shield that you'll see on the on the on the right hand side there. It fits inside that end shield, so it, it needs to it needs to be of a of a certain size and shape, um, and we we make that part and parcel of the. Of the rewind kit that comes that comes in from Germany, where we subcontract the um, our German friends to actually vulcanize that joint. So it'll it'll come vulcanized with the, the lead sticking out, and then what we do is that we just do uh, a, a straightforward butt joint, uh, winding to winding on that thing, and then we go ahead and do the connection. The connection on a on a on a job like this can can take anything between five and six days because of the of of how long of just how many layers of tape you're putting on there, and just the the precision and the amount of the precision workmanship that goes into ensuring that we have a, a watertight joint. So, so the, the the vulcanizing of that joint is, uh, is is really really of top importance. That's the uh, that's the completed winding on the on the non-drive end. She's, she's that's that's complete and ready for ready for acceptance of the of the of the rotor. You know, handling this, handling and testing this this pump is uh, is uh, is not easy. Um, you can appreciate that we we run the machine, we run the machine in, we run the machine vertically. She's three and a half meters long, and we and we run it in water. So so you've got to have a tube, you've got to have a a, 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 a test tube that we fill with water that is three and a half meters long, and then you obviously got to lift the the motor above three and a half meters, so you need uh, significant headroom. You need a headroom of about eight meters um, to to lift the pump in and uh, and and put it into the test bed. Um, in some instances, we've had to we because it, it it almost seems top heavy. In some instances, we've had to put special uh, we've had to construct we've had to put some do some civil work on the ground to try and accommodate this, the, the the pumps and then uh, and to to run it. So we so we run them underwater, and uh, at 6.6 .6 kV, and we we measure the the full power, the the, the, the full the full test. Um, you know, handling these handling these pumps and, and moving them from one location to another can be an absolute uh, can be a logistical nightmare because you're dealing with about 300 300 meters of power cable. I mean, and, and this particular instance on this one that we did. We've also got 300 meters of uh, auxiliary cable. Now, the auxiliary cables to is to measure the. You've got these RTDs that are 
that are situated inside the windings, and obviously that, that, that um, those measurements need to come up to the control panel. So, you know, you're looking at uh, significant weight, and it's uh, it's very very difficult to manhandle, and uh, and and in some instances, you know, we've got to send certain rigging procedures to the mines where where the, if you had to leave this to to, to uh, uh, some guy in the in the receiving and dispatch area, he might if he just went and picked this up thinking that it's just a normal load. It's uh, it's it's a it's it's quite an unusual load, so you've got to be quite aware. The other thing that's also of of quite significant importance is the is the shaft locking device. I mean, the shaft locking device on this on this pump is a is a is a significant piece of of equipment. I mean, you, you, you need a crane to to deal with that shaft locking device. It's a it's a precision it's a precision device that actually fits on there. That's uh, basically it's it's a size for size tolerance around the shaft that that that, that bolts onto the end of the end shield. Um, so yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's quite a it's 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 quite a hectic piece of equipment. And in some instances, I think a bit of an overkill, but uh, but that's what uh, that's what the end user requirements are. So you know. Fun, you know, water, you know, testing these things underwater, we get we get all sorts of unusual things happening on that particular pump that I mentioned earlier on. Um, the you know, some of the, the corrosion that actually happened around the steelwork caused all sorts of of weird um, losses that actually attributed to the to the full load current of the machine running or the no load current of the machine running somewhat higher than normal. But uh, that was it had nothing to do with the electrical performance of the machine. It had uh, it was just uh, it was frictional losses that were had come about as a result of the um, the corrosion around the around the the, the, the short circuiting arrangement. And uh, that's it. So that's uh, that's us fitting the pump in our in our in our, in our test bay here in Cleveland. And um, you know and we obviously we, we wanted to. To, to measure, we got we put big um, adaptive brackets in there, so that, so this thing could uh, could sit in a in a nice, firm and comfortable location within the within this tube of water, and um, and then testing it became quite an interesting operation as well because we needed to we needed to understand exactly what the the vibration parameters were on the on both uh, drive in and non drive in, but the non drive in being four or nearly four meters underwater. And we had no real way of um, securing any any transducers to the to the to the actual housing itself. We eventually we had, we had to in, uh, engage with Bentley Nevada, who gave us some. I wouldn't have bought. We had to we had to buy some some pretty fancy transducers, some magnetic transducers that we could fit onto the machine. So we had to fit all the transducers onto the machine and and secure them on. To the casing prior to the machine being introduced into the water, um, so that was it there. And then um, the, the the you know the thrust the, the thrusting of this machine is also of of, of top importance, and uh, that's uh, I think that's a topic for another discussion. It's just exactly how how those um, how the machines actually, or how to predetermine the thrust in the non-driving side of this of this arrangement. It's quite an quite an involved process that takes uh, quite a lot of stuff, but but we measure we measure the thrust um, and we measure the, the the movement as she's as she gains magnetic center, and then we record all that, and we we obviously measure RPM and uh, and vibration. So I don't know. We had a little bit of a video of it, but I. So, so the you know it, it was quite weird when we when we tested our first one we didn't we didn't realize exactly how hot and how quickly the water actually heated up. But uh, you know, there's obviously a lot of mechanical there's obviously a lot of losses that are that are being absorbed by the water and uh, um, you know there's obviously a, fair, a lot of friction that goes in there and the and it's a it's a it's a very limited amount of water, so we could only run the machine for like two hours, and then the, the water temperature got up to about 70 degrees. But it was quite interesting because we actually measured the 
the water temperature uh, in conjunction with the with the whole performance with the whole performance of the of the of the motor, and we and we could safely give it a, a clean bill of health. You know, you know once once again, uh, I think uh, we you know taking into account that we we basically did this alone with 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 very very little help from any overseas OEMs and stuff like that. I think uh, I think the guys at MNC did well, and uh, you know. We, we performed it in South Africa by South Africans, which I think it was an amazing thing, and uh, it was a it was a it was a magnificent thing to to the industry because I mean, if we didn't go ahead and do this, I mean, I don't think these end users would have had much, you know, would have had many options but to do is to to pack up these these complex motors and send them overseas and get them repaired in in, in Europe. Um, I, you know, and it, it just uh, it just delays things and and just adds considerable cost. So yeah, so we I think we learned a lot, and uh, we've now won four or five of these machines now, and uh, they're working they're working well. So yeah, that's a, a bit of fun, you know, uh, just trying to put these rotors in. They they they're, they're quite complicated little things to put in, and they're quite heavy. So. We just go back to first principles and trying to get them in. But yeah, um, acknowledgements to, to Andritz, who's the, the, the OEM in Germany, who we work very closely with, and we are uh, an approved service provider, the one and only approved service provider on the, on the African continent, to TCTA, who are the, the, the end users of a, a large population or a large fleet of these things, to our, 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 our friends in Zambia, who entrust us with their dewatering process and obviously to to our team here in, at MNC for, for putting together and, and executing in, in true style and, and just proving to, to everyone what our capabilities are and more importantly what, what South Africans what South Africa's capability is. And I think it was a it was a good good job all around. And most importantly to to the SAIEE, I mean for allowing us the opportunity to to show us what uh, what our capabilities are, and we're delighted in, in sharing our, our capability with with all of those around us. And uh, thank you very much indeed to to everyone involved. If I can just show, say something there myself, is um, a lot of you will know the way that this uh, that these presentations go. And although this might sound like a plug for MNC, and obviously I work there, and Richard runs the place. Um, the 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 background, Joanne and then we'll know the background of how this presentation was initiated. It wasn't initiated by us, it was requested by someone from the from the rotating machine section. So whoever that was, um, thank you. And it, and in fact, I just want to say that there's a little bit of difficulty in this presentation, is that there's, there's quite a lot of valuable information in it. And I when I first went to Richard and said, can we do the presentation, I was nervous that it might have been given a note. So, it, it might sound like a plug, but it's actually a very proud sort of sharing of, of information that, that was initiated by someone else. And I think that goes, but it's a lot of credit to, to MNC, to Richard, to the whole team, and to whoever promoted it from the, the rotating machine section. So to, to them, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you, Rob. That was an uh, interesting uh, discussion, and we really appreciate all this kind of knowledge. And uh, you know, I've always thought of submissible motors as just uh, small machines that you find uh, that the plumbers and other people use. But I was surprised there's something this big. <laughs> so, but thank you very much, guys, for that presentation, and we hope you will be able to share more stuff in the future. Thank you very much. Now it's time for questions. Yeah, thank you. Okay, but uh, Richard, yeah, you're welcome. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. And then Rob as well. Thank you, John. Okay, uh, uh, colleagues, now it's time for questions. And I see there's one or two questions that the, the people have already put up. And uh, uh, one question is a phenomenal job at uh, uh, MNC. Question, why was a porous wine, why insulation not used? And then the state of VIP. Instead of the sealed insulation, uh, and not not use, and then the state of VIP. Let me say that instead of the uh, thing repeated, and not the 
was used. I, I don't know whether you get the question, Richard, Rob. Yeah, I th it's just down to the OEM preference, uh, Chabu. You get some, we, we've done some um, submersible pumps that run, that are normal global VPR, um, and they run in oil. Um, we've done, we've done uh, um, global VPR uh, windings that run in um, refrigerant. So the different mm -hmm. OEMs have different preferences. I, I think it's just fair to say that this is Andritz's preference. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do believe, though, that I uh, possibly found that this method might be better for the dirtier water applications. Um, where it's uh, because of the wire. Um, I, I know that we have significant difficulties, not with the VPR process that we apply on, on the modern refrigerant motors, but getting cable for the leads uh, that, that withstand that uh, refrigerant's corrosive uh, capability is very difficult. I also think to try and totally encapsulate a machine that's three and a half meters long, um, and to try and protect it against some of these these harsh environments could also be quite a quite a big challenge. And uh, I agree with Rob there. We I think the wire and the the coating around the wire will will certainly uh, you know it, it it allows you to do a whole lot of in process tests and uh, and 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 allows for a lot of reliability while it's in service. But I think you know trying to encapsulate a a 6.6 .6 kV machine in three and a half meters in diameter, uh, I think that would be quite a be quite a challenge. And I think it would be, and basically throw away technology. I think it would almost be like uh, like these dry type transformers today. So you can't go back and fix it. Whoever asked the question, if you want, if you're interested, De Beers use a, um, a submersible motor, a dredger motor, um, or a, I think a sea water, sea floor, uh, seabed uh, um, pump and it runs in pressurized oil and it's globally VPR'd and it's made by Bucker Slirat. Uh, I can't I can't spell Slirat now on this um, thing, but Bucker B A double K E R. Um, thank you, uh, Rob and Richard. I've got another question from Petrus. Um, thank you very much for a very impressive uh, uh, webinar. Um, sorry, the question's just a bit. Um, what, was, what was overall time frame to perform the work? Overall time frame. Uh, okay, so that's quite an interesting question because um, obviously the 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 rewind kit that comes out of Europe, that is, that becomes the critical part. So, so your weight, your weight between anything, you, you, it won't be less than three months for a for a rewind kit. And then once the once the kit is once the kit is once we take delivery of the kit and to to final final test, we're probably looking at about six or seven weeks. Yeah. So from the so from the from the from the day we obviously we we take the machine to pieces and then we do the assessment then we go ahead and order all the spare parts you know there's a there's a lot of mechanical parts that also have to come in uh, mechanical seals are also quite complicated and um, there's also quite a long lead time on the mechanical seals but so we obviously do all the preparation the cleanup and everything like that ahead of time and uh, and then once once the kit arrives we can we can probably spin that spin that rewind around in in yeah, between four and five weeks. Um, then I've got another question from Vasile. What can be said about the almost current losses and efficiency, electrical efficiency? Sorry, Joanne, you broke up there. Can you repeat that? Yes, um, I've got another question from Vasile. What can be said about the low load current? Losses and efficiency, electrical efficiency. Okay, I, um, I, I'm going to guess on this. It's no load current and efficiency. So there was no difference in the no load current from well, a fractional difference. What Richard said about a few, but not even a few percent. But where there was a substantial uh, difference was in the no load losses. 
the the no load friction and windage losses were three times uh, higher on the damaged rotor, the corroded rotor, than they were on the on a new rotor. On a new and in fact, it was quite funny because um, Andritz came back to test engineers, and that when we sent them the original results, they came back and said to Richard, "No, there's something wrong here." And uh, and only once we, I think we repeated the test. No, we took it. Yeah. Took a piece of it. Yeah, we took it to pieces. We told them it was uh, that they insisted we take it to pieces to check it, and and w that we eventually we verified that we were in fact correct that it was the the, the increased turbulence. And you can imagine, I mean, that rotor spinning at 1500 RPM in a in a mixture more, more viscous than just pure water due to the glycerine. So the, the friction will be substantial. So yeah, that's what what we did, um, and we would have done. We, uh, a variable voltage no load in order to in order to verify the iron losses and the and the friction and windage losses and that was the key that uh, issue that hundreds were partly concerned in that the rope that the stator had been damaged by rubbing and that those increased losses were were stator core losses which they weren't see the other thing about it also is that the zambian machines also run with a massive cooler on the back of it i mean uh, the, the the cooler that fits on the back on the on the on the back end of the of the motor is it's probably the best part of three meters long as well and that's also pre-charged with water and that actually and there's also another little turbine in front in, inside there that actually spins the water around inside there and um the cooling effect is is, is from the ambient water inside the borehole so so that's the, that, so they get uh, um additional cooling from the from the ambient water inside the inside the, the hole itself Uh, then I have uh, another question from uh, Bruce. Since MNC has rewound five of these motors, what is the lead time for rewinding a submersible pump at this stage? What's the lead time? Yeah, on, the, on these particular time, on these particular machines, I think it's we've answered it before, but I mean, on these particular type of submersibles, um, you're looking at probably three and a half, four months, you know, you know from, from, from date of arrival to date of dispatch. Um, the other thing about it also is that we mustn't, uh, don't, we, 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 you know, on some of the smaller submersibles, you know, some of the domestic and some of the smaller industrial type of submersibles, it's not economically viable to go ahead and wind the machines. So, you know, so there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's a very, very big difference between uh, domestic, small industrial, and these large industrial. Great. And uh, then I've got another question uh, from Jim. Have you considered using only one long length for both poles of each phase, and therefore removing the need for three connections to be made up? I appreciate this would cause a little more need for careful handling, but it would reduce connection risk. Yeah, so yeah, that's a that's a that's a that's a good point because uh, we when you when you take the machines to pieces, I mean, so what happens is that the OEMs actually they actually incorporate in their in their winding design they incorporate the crossover to go on the on the on the plane inside of the winding. So. And that was that was where we we had to we had to make quite a we had to make quite an interesting call there because we didn't it doesn't matter what type of communication we had with the with the guys overseas is that they could never explain to us exactly how to do this whole thing and it was it was it was gaining a half turn and losing a half turn as a result of the crossover in the in the non-driving side we didn't we didn't think it was we thought it was high risk to go ahead and actually go ahead and attempt this uh, this, um, this this half turn crossover, you know, on the on the non connection side, because if something if something went haywire, and uh, and we and we picked up a, an incorrect resistance, then we would have had to we would have had to sacrifice a whole a, a whole winding, and we didn't have and we don't we don't we don't have the the luxury of having that uh, you know that you know, you know, spare windings lying around. So we decided that um, we'll just go back to 
to normal normal principles and on the front end just do the the the, the three cross connections but in but in the meantime you know giving ourselves enough room to to ensure a a, a, a top class connection so yeah we 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 We'd like to perfect that, and maybe when things normalise, is that we will get one of these guys to to come here, or we go over there, and they and they show us how this how this half turn works. But at the but at the meantime, we we prefer the the fail safe method of what we're doing at the moment. Great, thank you, Richard. And our final question for today is from Prof. Yandercook. Uh, do you know how the motors are electrically in service? Sorry, Joanne, you, you're sounding perfect at some stages, but then you disappear. Can you please okay. repeat the question? Uh, we know how it's from do, Prof. Yeah. Okay. Do you know how the motors are electrically No, you're disappearing again. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now, Rob? Yes, yes. Do you know, do you know how the motors are electrically No, jo Joanne, read the question just suddenly because you you dis you disappear after half the after half what you're saying. Just read the question very quickly, please. Uh, do you know how the motors are electrically? Joanne, just repeat the last part. The last part of that question. Um. <laughs> Um, how the motors are electrically protected in service. How they are electrically protected in service. Well, they, 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 well, they've got. I think they've probably got some. Uh, I, I, can't, I, I don't know the, the details of that. I'm not a protection guy, but I mean, I, I know that uh, I've, I've been privy to to some of the to some of the some of the um the controls on the top of these things but that's uh it's some very sophisticated vsds that look after these machines that uh that that um, you know and they uh like i say i don't know too much about it but uh there's some there's some very clever stuff on surface that looks after these machines it's a that's a pathetic answer i'm sorry no well it's actually uh, richard brings up the most important aspect uh, uh, everybody and prop is that they are vsd driven yeah. so their protection would incorporate everything that a medium voltage vsd would typically incorporate i don't know if that answers the question i see props linked up here on whatsapp because of the audio okay it's answered Thank you, Prof. Joanne, are you there? Yes, yes, I am there. Can you hear me, uh, Rob? Yes. Thank you. Um, if there's any other uh, further questions that we didn't have time for today, we we will be this will be downloaded and answered by the uh, presenters uh, afterwards. Um, over to you, uh, Jabu. Okay, I see Jabu has uh, lost uh, connectivity. Um, I just want to thank uh, Rob and uh, Richard for a uh, wonderful uh, presentation and for your time as well. Uh, um, for giving this uh, presentation. Uh, anything from your guys' side, uh, Richard and Rob? Only a pleasure. And uh, thank you very much for allowing me the time to 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 show you what we do. Yeah. From my side too. And thanks to Richard and his team for the, for the info and work to present. And thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Jabu. And thanks to all the uh, section members and, and anybody else who's attended. Thank you, um, and uh, thank you for everybody that has attended this webinar, and the webinar is officially closed. Thank you once again, and take care. Bye.
see what Mike said. Let us try to see. Couldn't talk. No, they, they fly. No, but they've been 